Roads must fall, fees must fall, colonialism must fall, uh, white monopoly capital must fall, capitalism must fall, white supremacy must fall. Ironies hoe baie mense vandag praat oor dinge wat moet val en hoe min mense praat oor dinge bou. Ek is Jaap Prederik, welkom by Polities Incorrect. My gast in die atelier is een voormalige ondersteuner van die Roads Must Fall beweging, maar het intussen tot ander politieke inzichten gekom. Ek is zelfs met Rob Duigen en ons praat oor waarom alles vandag blijkbaar moet val. Rob, welkom by die program. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, jammer dat ik uh, alles in Engels moet uitlees, maar... Um Ja, my woord is skat, het een paar gaat in hom. So, uh, Amal het genetische achterstande, so ek verstaan het jy altemaal. So, nie te neem neem. <laughs> ja. Hierdie, hierdie, ek denk, ek gaan een baie interessante gesprek wees. Um, ek, ek, ek sê kan, as jy, as jy ruids moest vol, vies moest vol, al die goed noem vir meeste van ons kijkers, dan raak allemaal klaar gerooi in die gezicht. Uh, van woede, nie van skamte nie. Mm. Jy het een interessante pad gestap in termen wat jou menings en jou sieningen betref. Kom ons begin met die begin en, en vir die mense wat nog nie alles kan onthou so ver terug sy 2015 met Rides Must Fall nie. Waarom het het gegaan um, en hoekom het jy betrokken geraak daarby? Ja, yeah. well, uh, it started out as a protest against the statue of Rhodes at UCT, uh, University of Cape Town. So, I mean, Rhodes basically founded the university with a trust left in his will and so the whole symbolism of the university revolves around Rhodes' legacy with which we can associate much of the colonialism and in fact the founding of the entire country. So a great deal of the cultural project of the current dispensation is decolonization and the reversing of white supremacist structures and so on. Um, But the form that it's really taken is to erase uh, elements of history that are uncomfortable or don't fit into a very simplistic binary narrative of white versus black, white people evil, black people good. Um, and at the time, the way that I was, I understood it because I was, uh, I come from a certain generation where you're raised under an ANC curriculum that convinces you of this very sort of noble and pure struggle um, for equality and, and human rights and so on, and that everything is a matter of progress. And when I was in high school in England, um, you know, because I, I left South Africa when I was 15 until uh, until the end of high school, um, I, I encountered teachers, <coughs> a teacher who introduced me to Karl Marx and John Stuart Mill, whose books I kind of carried around almost like Bibles, um, you know, having rejected Christianity and embraced the, this idea of sort of this democratic fundamentalism and sort of like everything must move to the full democratization of everything in society. This this is based on the idea that human beings are all pure and good in nature and the only thing that prevents them from being kind is uh, the strictures of society, the inequalities of society, material deprivation, so that, you know, man's evil side is not something that's actually his fault. It's always the fault of someone else. And... Uh, the idea is to sweep away these these things that prevent humans from realizing their full, pure, angelic potential. And so any kind of out, outburst of democratic sentiment, the more spontaneous the better, this is an expression of, you know, the will of the people, which is, you know, so, you know that old Latin saying, vox populi, vox dei, the you know, word of the people is the word of God. And... Um, if you believe it fundamentally, you think, well, okay, you look at Karl Marx and uh, his ideas of socialism or M- John Stuart Mill and his ideas of, you know, welfare, welfare state and subsidiarity and democracy and so on. You, you come to this sort of point where you think, well, everything has to move in that direction. And our whole c- country's political dispensation is based on sort of a slightly watered down version of the Freedom Charter. Our very constitution is based on, you know, social justice, which doesn't mean justice as really exists within human nature. It's the it's the justice of collective entities, social justice. So it's the equalization of society. That's what social justice means. So it's we must work towards communism eventually. Is the general understanding, and you you pick this up subconsciously th- uh, through your exposure to South Africa, and you learn that anything associated with the defense of any kind of tradition or any kind of conservation of uh, social character or identity amongst white people is actually some kind of evil 
that threatens to perpetrate inequalities and corruption in society. So when someone sort of points, uh, as points to the symbols of apartheid, I mean, I'd still sort of felt that, you know, renaming names is kind of foolish. Why, why erase the memories of the past when they can be used so much better as lessons? But we, 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 ha we were there at UCT, and UCT is a very left-wing university, and um, everyone ha it waits upon the, the, the sort of pure revolution to come when all of the kind of inequalities that still exist will be swept away. And it just never kept happening. It just kept never happening. And then in 2015, we had this funny chap who was from the ANC Youth League called Tumani Makwele. And he'd been a student for like a decade. I mean, this, this, this fellow was, uh, was a perennial Professional student. student. Professional yeah. student is a good term for it. But he was also reaching the cu age cutoff for the ANC Youth League. You know, in the ANC, if you want to make it, you know, you have to make it while you're in the Youth League. Make your mark while you're young, you know, so that people remember you and you get placed somewhere. But he hadn't done anything. Um, and so... And this is, uh, this is a detail that I learned later, is that he, he actually met Iqbal Survey at the Cape Jazz Festival uh, like a couple of months before, and they said, well, you must try some stunt art. And he, the, the recently, the, the, the most like edgy uh, uh, political protests at the time were the poo protests, where you had people who threw um, Porto Lou effluent all over the lobby of uh, Cape Town Airport, um, to protest about sort of living standards in the um, in the townships, amongst other things, and so he decided this will gain the most attention. So he takes he puts on a pink hard hat, takes his shirt off and puts on one of those like placards. You know when you see like those manic street preachers in the old cartoons. You know, um, you know it's like capital colonialism is dominating this university and blah blah blah. So he throws the, the on the statue and says, "Well, we want to see it removed and." You know, it's humiliating to see the person who dominate us, dominated us as the figurehead of our university, reminding us of who founded the entire nation. It's not humiliating to throw um, human excrement on, on statues and walk around half naked on a campus. That's not the humiliating part. No, the no, statue no, no. Is I mean, I, I, I sort of <laughs> thought it was in bad taste. And the moment where I was convinced to join is largely because of an experience that I had before university. So I worked as a farmhand in, on a farm in rural northwest province near Groot Marieke. This is an area where everything is very, very firmly racially segregated in an extremely open way. There's no double talk about it. It's people, no, white people must be separate from black people or this kind of stuff. And I was kind of young and at the time fairly cowardly. And so even though I objected to this and tried to push back at it in my very, very tiny pathetic ways, I went along with it. <laughs> So I felt a great sense of uh, guilt about, about my, my, my lack of resolve in, in, in that social environment. And when I went to university, a lot of the accusations of systemic racism didn't come across as particularly convincing to me because I'd seen sort of a vestige of real apartheid in the flesh. And so I didn't take all of the views seriously, but I thought, well, you know, Underneath it all, there's, there must be something because it's, it's democratic and it's spontaneous will of the people. So I found excuses to go along with them and support them. And the main one was that uh, there was a girl called Amira Conrad, and who's shame, shameless narcissist now, but at the time she was, she was still fairly convincing. Um, and I mean, she, she went on to make a, a, a sort of vicious dramatization of the, the whole events, which include calls for genocide and paraded it around Europe because she got, they, they got funded. They got this huge sort of, very sort of artsy, really, really terrible production. Um, b uh, but um, huge praise from all of the liberal press, like the Guardian newspaper and everything. But she, what she said to me at the time was she said, well, you know, it, well, she wasn't black. She's actually, you know, uh, Cape Malay. But she would say, you know, we're black and we're proud to be intellectual. At the time, of course, you know, Jacob Zuma saying all of the stuff about clever blacks and a very anti-intellectual environment. So I thought, well, it can't hurt because my experience of Northwest Province was that there are a lot of black people who internalized the, 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 the Bosque hierarchy. You could sit and argue with your fellow colleagues 
for ages and say, well, you know, we are, we should be earning the same, same amount and everything. No, you're white, you deserve to be earning more. I'm like, this, this really got into me very deeply. It horrified me. I mean, how, how can you get people who hate themselves so much and think so little of themselves that they're willing to advocate for their own denigration? And this made me think, okay, well, you know, people standing up for themselves and saying, well, no, we're not ashamed to be who we are. And we're proud of pursuing education, which, is, which can only be a positive. I thought, okay, well, I'll join. I'll show solidarity. So I went and occupied the buildings with them. I joined the meetings and sat in politely. And um, I, I, I even tried to help people form rhetorical strategies for, you know, but uh, I think I irritated a pe people a lot because I had that natural sort of caution behind it. And there came a moment when the statue came down. And um, at the time, it was Ramabina Mahapa, the leader of the Student Representation Council who for Sasko, who gave the speech which convinced the Senate to go from two-thirds against to, all but th uh, to unanimity with three abstaining for removing the statue. So this involved, like, I mean, we, we occupied all the admin buildings and kicked out, uh, kicked out the staff. It was, uh, you know renamed the buildings, you know, sort of very dramatically. And um, I mean, it was a lot of fun uh, at first, but something happened when the statue came down, which is that they held a little meeting and everyone decided that they knew that the protest was about more than the statue, but they didn't know what. They knew that they had to maintain this momentum and gain some kind of control and so on. They didn't know how to do it. And I remember in this meeting, this was my first and last contribution um, I pointed out that, okay, we have some people in this movement who've been a little bit rowdy and they've attracted some negative comments in the press. And so this might sort of embarrass the movement. What you want is a bit of control and to prevent things from getting out of hand. Because they're already, you know, some people are fairly sort of, you know, racially aggressive. Not many, but some. And mainly from the PAC, or this PASMA, their student branch. After I said this, the next person who stood up didn't address me but addressed the crowd and said, we don't want outsiders dictating to us how to run our revolution. Of course, that was the last meeting any white person was allowed to participate in. And they justified this with reference to Steve Biko, who black people must organize amongst themselves, white people must go into their own communities and destroy them. Uh, and uh, so you get this group called Disrupting Whiteness. The whole bunch of very sort of mislick, depressive, anxiety-ridden, um, guilt-ridden, white, you know, posh white English people for the most part, who held a lot of these self-flagellating meetings where they talked about how to um, spread the word of white privilege and get people to capitulate to, to the movement. Um, and th these efforts were not, were not appreciated. They, had, uh, they eventually invited a couple of black radicals to come and speak to them. And the, it was made very clear to them that even what they were doing there in dismantling the last remnants of their sense of self-worth was not good enough. They have no value, they have no place, they have no purpose. And the movement and eventually disbanded. I want to ask you something interesting there. <clears throat> you just spoke about white supporters of, of, of the Rose Was Fall movement and, and, and in general, um, fallism and leftism um, in general. If you look at the white supporters of these anti-white campaigns and the black supporters, they have two very different profiles, right? What do you, what do you make of that? Well, most of the white supporters are English. <laughs> but I, I think I find the white people to be the most poisonous individuals in the whole movement. Uh, I mean, of course, there's some truly evil people amongst uh, the black supporters as well. I mean, the thing about me is because I'm, I'm an incessive and uh, incessant talker and an obsessive person, I would actually ask very persistent questions to even the most radical people like Masak um, Landu or Slovo Magida or whoever. And I mean, Slovo Magida was uh, an incredibly uh, interesting person to talk to. And this is, a, this is the six foot five black guy who's built like a brick house who speaks German, sings opera, and I mean, fantastic voice. Let me not uh, take anything away from him. But he was raised by, he was raised by the... Um, his, mother, his mother's employers because he never knew his father and his mother died when he was 12. So he's raised by a white family. And here he is on campus demanding white genocide. And he would tell it to you to your face. 
and make, make an argument for it, like a cold, calculating, intellectual argument for it. And he wasn't the only one. There's several people like this. So uh, the way that they moved on from Roads Must Fall is it sort of fizzled out a little bit. But the, the social groups and the social media groups remained. And it quickly became a totalitarian environment in which it didn't matter where you are or who you were friends with. If you were not with the movement, if you showed any sign of resistance to it, you would immediately be ostracized and accused of an incredible degree of, uh, of nasty white supremacy. I was still a communist at the time. And I sort of politely said to, to my friends, I said, okay, well, you know, we all believe in this universal sort of project and we want to get there and so on. And, but we have a problem that there's people over here who are openly calling for genocide, like, the, the, you know, one settler, one bullet, and, you know, Dabulai, Bunu, all of those things. And, and I said, well, look, I'm, I'm really concerned because all of the ideas that they're picking up from Franz Fanon, Steve Beaker, and Kimberly Crenshaw, so I mean, Kimberly Crenshaw's intersectionality and standpoint epistemology, and what this means is that if you are privileged, it means that you simply cannot see the world. You cannot understand the world of the oppressed. You have to take it by fiat. You cannot criticize it. You cannot ask questions. You must simply obey. Um, you must simply accept what you're told. Um, because if you disagree with them, then you're asserting your privilege um, and dominating the, the discourse. I, I sort of wrote this like little Facebook letter to like all of my other friends in the moon and I tagged them and I said, well, hey guys, look, I'm, I'm really concerned about this. Maybe we should think about this because if this gets out of control, maybe 10, 15 years down the line, we'll see real fascism emerging in the country, you know, like somewhere. And they, yeah, and then they laughed at me. They ridiculed me. And within, within a couple of days, it was Robert is a white supremacist. I was still openly a non-racialist communist and they were calling me a white supremacist. So as iemand wat jou eie siening oor hierdie type bewegings verander het, hoe oortuig jy mense wat vatbaar is vir hierdie type ideologie, vooral jong mense, dat destructieve, agressieve, nazi-achtige hmm. bewegings toch nie goeie goed is om by betrokken te raak nie? Well, it's very difficult because, you, you know, as you know, you you can't tell a kid, you know, which way is up. Um, it's very difficult. It's something that, you know, people have to, it, it, all of these kind of things are things that people really have to work out for themselves. I mean, sometimes your kid might be someone you can persuade, but that's not always the case. I think everyone knows this. Everyone's, everyone's had, had resistance to their parents' advice. And particularly if there's a massive social stigma as exists now against any form of defensiveness from white people. That's, the thing is, we have it much more than the Americans or the, or the British do because we have this concept of swart gefaar. If you think that the, black, that the black community is in any way dangerous or in any way capable of evil in any reasonable or serious way, um, like any human community is, but if you think that of black people, you're guilty of engaging in swart gefaar. You're really sort of participating in the sort of spiritual sin of apartheid, but recapitulated. And so kids are absolutely terrified, but not just of social judgment. They've internalized it. It's, it, it's become an almost spiritual level problem. So you can't go, uh, it, it's going to be very, very difficult to convince them because they've got, we've gotten to the point where this is a normal part of society. And so some people will listen, some people won't. You put the idea out, you hope for the best. But I met people, I meet white kids over there who I put this argument forward and I say, well, you know, sort of quietly explain to them, well, look, I mean, we've got this and this and this and this, and you've noticed this and you've heard these arguments, you know. Um, and I mean, all of it's tied with land reform and everything. It's, it's you, know. you get to the bottom and then they admit, they're, they're, they've, okay, they acknowledge everything that you've seen finally, and then they say, well, maybe it's our turn. And that brings me back to Northwest Province. I thought I couldn't understand these people who had internalized a racial hierarchy where they were morally inferior. And then I saw kids of my own cultural background adopt the same attitude, only much more severe, we don't deserve to live level. And uh, it was an extremely profoundly disorienting and in many ways traumatizing experience because I mean, I'm not, I, 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 for a long time I looked back on that and, and felt enormous shame, enormous shame that I didn't do anything or say anything. But honestly, what could I have done? I was made an in, a complete outsider. 
Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's history now because it's spread to every single university. So every single university for the most part, there's some departments in some universities that manage to shelter themselves from the winds of change. But overall, it's every single university and increasingly every single school. Because a lot of the substance of these ideas are things that they brought from the Americans. They combine American critical race theory with African revolutionary nationalism. And you end up in the situation where, and uh, there's a man called Richard Wilkinson who used to be a, um, a, pol a legal policy advisor to the DA in Cape Town. And he's working on a project at the moment that I believe should come out shortly. Um, but he's looking at this, this, the impact of this on schools. And this whole cohort that came out of the universities are not teaching in schools. They're indoctrinating children with these ideas. If you're white, you know, any kind of criticism uh, of, of black people or self-defense against black people is morally wrong. You know, they are th they're suffering. You need to make sure that you never hurt their feelings or make them feel uncomfortable in any way. And you are responsible for making yourself, yourself feel uncomfortable about your heritage and constantly criticize and demean your own inheritance. And it, it leaves people in a position where self-hatred is mandatory. And the only way that you can displace this guilt is to turn it into shame. And shame is a narcissistic psychological function in which you turn your projected self-image um, outwards. And the way that people deal with this is instead of feeling guilty and thinking, I'm a shame, they say, all the other white people who haven't gotten as transformed as I am, they're the evil. So anytime they feel guilt or pain or shame from their association with their skin color's association with history, they can turn all of that emotional energy to castigating their own families and their friends. And that's why white liberal communities are so vicious and so poisonous because everyone is petrified of not keeping up with the next wave of recrimination. And this, I, I don't have a far, fast and firm solution to you, but I would desperately hope that people would pay attention to what is being taught in their schools, make sure they look at the curricula, make sure that they look at the, the school's policies, who are they hiring for, um, training programs, uh, do they at any point talk about diversity, equity and inclusion because that's a, a fantastic euphemism for these kind of ideas. Um, so it really is pernicious because it, it gets everywhere and the problem with it is these people who graduate from university, in five to ten years they become the leaders of corporations, of political parties, of government departments and it becomes increasingly the status quo. These ideas that were unheard of when they first erupted in, in 2015, they are now the water we, we swim in. It's the air we breathe today. And how long has it been? It's been six years. Where are we going to be in 2024, 25? You know, will there be any space to resist this? That's the question. It's, you know, how do you deal with this? I think the first step is whatever you're going to do, you first have to recognize it and say no. Rob, I thank you for time. Hi, Ranky. Thank you. Mensen gedink het in die 21ste eeuw na lesse geleerheid Nazi Duitsland, Rwanda, Kenia se Malma opstande en natuurlijk se Afrika se apartheid. Sou niemand gedink dit is 'n goeie idee om ras as 'n maatstaf vir enig iets te gebruik nie. Maar blykbaar is daar mense wat vir my verskil. Dankie dat jy politiese en gekyk het. Tot volgende keer.